Join us, friends. Great Scott Spot Guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost Spot Guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the Spot Guy, and it is... I'm glow trotting with Trey. Last time I thought about it. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey, but we know that there's a lot of people that are. So on today's show, we're going to talk about famous people. Mm. Have you ever met a famous person? I have. Mm. I know Trey has. So we're going to talk about that. And just what was it like? Was it awkward? Was it uh, a, a monumental moment that you'll remember forever? Were they mean? Were they nice? What happened? And I know that you've got a lot of stories. I think you've probably met more famous people than I have, would be my guess. Uh, I've met a handful. Um, but, uh, it's, and, and what denotes a famous person as well. And when I'm saying famous, I mean, um, you could be famous or you could be infamous. In this case, we'll talk about, um, probably for the most part, celebrities, Mm -hmm. uh, what we would call famous celebrities, but there's also people that, that would be famous in certain circles. So it may be someone that's famous in that circle, like me and you are YouTube famous. And uh, I went to a thing yesterday uh, where uh, Lori and I went to see a show, and I'm walking down the street in this little town, and I hear somebody, hey, it's a spa guy. What are you doing here? And- <laughs> yeah, that's different, isn't it, Billy, when that yeah. happens? Yeah, that's it not happens really to, it, famous. It happened to me uh, last month in a, a casino. Where at? Tell us about that. In Biloxi. Um, a, guy, Biloxi. a guy was like, glow trotting with Trey. And I was with my dad, and I, I heard it from the distance. And I turned around, and he approached me, and he had, uh, was a big fan of, of the show, a big Elvis uh, fan. And um, and it was, that was pretty cool. It was different, though, because I heard it from the distance, and I was like, oh, they watched the show. You know, it takes me a minute to register that. Yeah. Um, also, uh, another uh, girl uh, that I met – um, she, uh, I, I was filming at, at Elvis week and you know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to say her name cause she don't like to put her names out there, but, uh, they were, they were doing an interview by, um, and yes. e, uh, yeah, ETA. ETA. Yes. I and, agree. uh, and, uh, I was just standing there filming some B-row and the next thing I know, she was like, started waving at me and, you know, I'm turning around cause you know, she's a real pretty girl. I was turning around. I was like. She's waving at me. Hey, how are you doing? And, uh, and glow trotting with Trey. Oh, she watches the show. So I was like, wow, you know. You had one uh, at Talladega recently, didn't you? A couple of months ago. Am I yeah. remembering that right? You were at a race. You were at something. Um, Somebody came up to you. You were at an event or something. No, yes. I was filming a event for my city. And one of the vendors came up to me, which was a younger, um, a younger guy. And he was like, glow trotting with Trey. Uh, me and my dad, we watch you. Can you talk to my dad? So he called his dad up on the phone. Yeah. And I was like, hey, man, yeah, it's Trey. You know, and I spoke on the phone with his dad and thanked him for watching the show. So that's kind of cool because it, it, it shows you that people are watching. People like people what watching. you do uh, with this show. And I'm sure Trey feels the same way. Uh, just so you know, if you ever see us, say something. Say, hey, come over and say, we're not, uh, we want you to, we, it feels good to know that people watch. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I listen to a podcast with the Brady, the real Brady bros. It's, it's, it's Peter and Greg, um, which is Barry Williams and uh, Christopher Knight. And they talk about that kind of stuff. And the biggest, their biggest pet peeve is uh, both of them. I think, I think Barry, Greg is a little bit more uh, into that than, than Chris is. I think Chris Peter is a little bit more reserved and it and it kind of throws him off a little bit when somebody approaches him. But to me, those guys are, I mean, they I knew that was 50 years ago when I was a kid and I watched yeah. the Brady Bunch. Everybody knows the Brady Bunch. So I can imagine they get approached a lot. But what usually they said the most important thing for them was, or the uh the thing that got them upset the most was when they would be with their wife or a a family member or a child 
and someone would approach them and then they would look around and go, well, who are you? Are you anybody? Yeah. You know, they would do that kind of stuff. So anytime that you see those folks, acknowledge their wives or their kids or whoever's there yeah. and, uh, you know, try to make it a pleasant experience for them too, because they're excited. It's exciting to us when it happens. It doesn't happen much, but it does happen. And, and it's fun. It, it lets us know that what we're doing is reaching people and, and people are watching and it makes it more fun for us. Now we're not uh Brady bros level, uh, 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 Brady famous. But while we're on the subject of Brady's, we went to the Brady house and <laughs> one famous. What are the odds? Yeah. How do we meet Cindy? Uh, Cindy Brady. How did we do that? <laughs> I mean, she's at the Brady house. Um, her real name is not Cindy Brady. So let's say her real name. Um, do you remember it? Yeah, it's um, 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 uh, Olsen. Uh, Susan, uh, Susan, Susan Olsen. That's Susan right. Olsen. And Susan, they said something I find interesting on their podcast. They said that of all the the six kids, that she's the least like her her character. She's really kind of loudmouth and rough, and Cindy is is reserved and laid back. She's not like that at all. Right. And she said they told a story about when uh, in between shoots there was someone that was a family member of one of the 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 uh the crew or something in between scenes and she was on the kitchen table coloring or writing and sh she heard this kid that saw her over there and said well she's she can write and she turned around and said well yeah i can write what do you think <laughs> <laughs> and it made her mad you don't think i can write just because yeah. of you know playing yeah. a young kid on the show yeah i mean come on man yeah. So um, tell us uh, about some. I've got a, a a story. I'll let you go first on something. But but you and I together met Susan Olson at the Brady House. How surreal was that? That and was you've got a cool. video yeah. about that out, and I have a video about that. I out. was luckily filming, and that was cool to actually meet the actor at the famous house for her show for the Brady Bunch show. I mean, that's a character in itself, the Brady Bunch house, because yeah. I believe. Uh, it's been a long time since I've watched the Brady Bunch, but I believe every episode they popped a shot of the uh, of the house before. Yeah, the, uh, what starts. we would call a beauty shot, except yeah. for the very first episode. The first okay. episode was a different house. Okay. Episode uh, season one, episode two, all the way to the end was that house was the beauty shot. That's right. Yeah. So, man, how lucky did we get, Billy, that Susan Olsen come out on the front lawn and talk to us? You know, and yeah. I'm asking her questions. Now, yeah. I wish and I would actually got to talk to her. Yeah, but I wish I yeah. would have known about her being in an Elvis movie. Yeah. I didn't even think about that, you know, yeah. so maybe next time. But I have really been lucky so far because I have been able to meet some of my favorite stars of all time. And I don't think everyone gets that opportunity, Billy. And so I'll go ahead and get into my stories because I yeah, have a few, few of them. All right. So the first one I have to talk about, I got to go to a party a Hall of Fame party of the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan. The GOAT. And everybody that, if you know me personally, you know that Trey is probably one of the biggest Michael Jordan fans in this world. No doubt, since I've been a little kid, Michael Jordan's always been my, my, my basketball hero. And uh, so when he went into the Hall of Fame in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, the home of basketball in 2009, I had to be there. So I taught my granddad and my uncle to going, uh, taking me to Springville, Massachusetts and going with me to this. And me and my uncle bought $1,000 tickets to be there. Yeah. They jacked the prices up because Michael Jordan was going into the hall of fame. Wow. Yeah. And he even Michael Jordan, even that night in his speech, thanked them for jacking the prices up because he was going in and he said he paid all the prices for all of his family and friends to be there. So thank you, Hall of Fame, for doing that. You know, by being real sarcastic, like, you yeah. know, I see what y'all did. You know, and how I far is that from your house? That was a ways. Oh, yeah. We had to fly on an airplane, hotel, and everything up in, you know, it's, it's the border of Connecticut and Massachusetts. Yeah. Because my story happens in Connecticut. So I go to the Hall of Fame, and that is just, that's awesome. I actually filmed that. I probably, I need to do a show about that one day. Yeah, but uh, so the next night, the NBA Hall of Famers have a ring ceremony 
at the uh, Mohegan Sun Casino in uh, Connecticut, Hearts, Hartsville, Connecticut, or something like that. Uh, but uh, so I go to it, and uh, Billy, it was the quickest hundred dollars I ever pulled out of my pocket. And what I mean by that is you had to get have a ticket to go to this ceremony. It was in a an event venue inside the casino. And uh, so we get to the door. It was me, my granddad, and my uncle. And um, this guy had an extra ticket. And I was like, how much you want for it? And he said, um, $100. I pulled 100 out as quick as I can. My uncle and granddad said that they had never seen me give away money that quick. <laughs> I left them outside, mm. and I went into the <clears throat> to the uh, <laughs> to the event. They got in free and had better seats than me. Wow. So anyway, when I was in there, I noticed Michael Jordan's table was up at the front, of course. And uh, I walked around before the event and got some pictures of the uh, the statues and things up front. They had some. They gave the Hall of Famers these beautiful crystal basketball statues. So I cool. I saw Michael Jordan's statue. So I took some really great photos. But there was this old man that was sitting there at a table just by himself, and he looked familiar to me. And I knew that he was somebody in basketball, and I just couldn't place him. So me being me, I went and introduced myself to him. Hey, Trey, sit down. I'm Coach um, Johnny Bach. I used to be the Chicago Bulls assistant coach when, with Michael. Yeah, Coach Bach, that's how I know you, you know. So I, I'm, I'm asking him stories about Michael, and he's telling me his favorite stories about MJ. And guess what he said? He said that Michael flew him here paid for his tickets to be here and said that he had to be there, that he wasn't going to take no for an answer. Wow. So coach Bob, Michael Jordan said, coach, you got to be here. You know, I'm paying for everything. You're going to be here. So he was sitting there. And I remember a girl that was working, thanked me uh, for c coming over there because I guess he had been sitting there alone for a long time. And she, she thanked me for coming over there. Cause you know, so how excited he was, man, that was so incredible. So coach Bach and, uh, but anyway, so after the ceremony, I noticed all the people that were at the tables were Michael and his family were sitting at. And uh, so I did the same thing. I went up there and I introduced myself to Leroy Smith. And who Leroy Smith is, y'all have all heard of him because the famous story of Michael Jordan being cut from his high school varsity basketball team in high school. Everybody has heard that story. Well, Leroy and Michael were in the same class in the 10th grade. Leroy, though, at this point was six, seven. Michael was around six feet at this point in his life. They selected Leroy to play varsity and they sent Michael to the B team that year. So Michael Jordan being Michael Jordan, he flew his old friend Leroy Smith to his Hall of Fame, put him in the audience and then joked about him to the whole world live on television. <laughs> So that's I started telling Leroy about, man, it was so cool, Michael, bringing you up yesterday. And he was telling me. And so we were, I was, you know, asking questions and stuff. And he said, hey, uh, Trey, if you really want to learn about Michael, you need to talk to that guy right there. He pointed to this white guy that was just sitting there minding his business, Billy. Little bitty white guy just sitting there drinking a beer. He had a coat on and a black shirt, and he had the white jump man right here. I'll never forget it. Me and DB, we talk about it all the time these days. And uh, so his name was David Bridgers, and David Bridgers, DB, was Michael's best friend growing up, and they're still that close today. So DB telling me all these cool stories of he and Michael Jordan playing Little League Baseball together, and Michael betting that he's going to hit a home run on a team and taking that team's money and hitting the home run and running around the bases, telling them, I told you I would hit one. I told you at 11 years old. So he yeah. was betting way back. Michael Jordan <laughs> was Michael Jordan before the world knew Michael Jordan. <laughs> yeah. And DB is just like Michael. And they were tight. And I, I'm telling you, they, they fought each other. They battled each other on, in games. They taught junk to each other. These guys – and my and DB still talks junk to Michael, you know, but uh, uh, he's a real friend to MJ, and I'm sure that uh, MJ loves that about uh, DB. But Keeps him grounded, yeah, unbelievable. Yes, he does. Great friend to have. But anyway, so DB was telling me these stories, and man, he he said something. He said, Trey, I'll tell you what, if your if your granddad and uncle will let you, I'll take you up to M's party. They call him M. They call Michael Jordan M. His closest people M. I'll take you up to M's party. Oh, yeah, they'll let me, DB. And I'm sure I said something like that, excited as I was. So uh, DB took me up to Michael's party that night. 
The security opened the doors for me. He gave me a, a, a band like this. This is a Michael Jordan band that I wear, but this is not the one. But it's a North Carolina Tar Heel color band that Michael gave to all of his family and friends. That's how he, you can get into my party. And it says MJ Hall of Fame on the band. I still have wow. it. DB gave it to me and said, I'll just walk in. Security opened the door. Of course, DB walked in. I walked in. D man, I'm telling you, this gets even better, man. I'm in there with all of my favorite basketball players that I grew up loving. And they're coming up and talking to me because DB's introducing me to Run Harper, to Scottie Pippen, to, to, to um, <laughs> Charles Oakley. Spike Lee is behind me. I turn around and there's Spike Lee right there. I'm talking to all these people that I've always liked, you know. And then Michael is sitting at the table, um, Billy. And he's sitting there with his, his wife, which I think was his fiance at that point. And his mama is at the table. And his older brother is at the table, okay? So Michael sees DB and he gets up, gives up and gives him a big old uh, bear hug, asking where he's been. And uh, so anyway, they chat for a few seconds. And DB does the coolest thing, man, that you could do. DB said, hey, M, I want you to meet my good friend from Alabama, Trey Miller. And I'm standing there, man, and Michael looks at me, Billy, and he looks into my eyes and he says, uh, nice to meet you, Trey. And I say the craziest thing that anybody could ever, ever say at this moment, meeting your hero. I say, Mr. Jordan, I'm a big fan. <laughs> it's an honor to meet you. I've, I've asked myself a million times, why did I call him Mr. Jordan? You know, why did I call him Mr. Jordan? But you lose, you lose something about yourself when you're in these situations because your heart's pounding. You can't believe that you're actually standing there with a person that you've loved, that you've never met. You've just seen through televisions, watching games. Uh, everybody, I told everybody that I was going to go meet Michael Jordan and everybody laughed at me. Then I did, I made it happen. And, and the, the coolest thing happened. I stayed in that party for four hours, Billy. And uh, at some point during that time in there, all of his family and friends like turned into fans, man. I had never seen anything like it. And what I mean is everybody wanted photos with Michael and he was signing autographs to everybody. Uh, it was incredible, man. So I said, hey, this is my opportunity. I had my camera on me. Actually, this camera right here. That's the camera that took the photo. Now that's the one that got messed up when you took a picture. And that's, of, and I'm a, yes, I'm going to get to that. Okay. I've All saved right. this, of course. That's my camera. Can't believe you messed up on me, man. But anyway, <laughs> that took a Okay, so I uh, I had been talking to this lady named Stacy, really sweet lady, real nice. And she was Michael, one of Michael's financial advisors. He has many financial advisors, as I've learned. He needs a bunch. But Stacy yeah. was a financial advisor to Mike, and she loved how I had – talk myself into the into the party she loved that i had flown from alabama that i was in here with them she just loved it and uh so i'm sitting there with stacy and michael starting taking photos with everybody so i whip my camera out hey uh i think i called him michael this way hey michael can i get a, a picture yeah sure man and i had the coolest picture of me and mj and michael smiling like like we're friends or something you know and stacy took the photo and i took a photo of stacy and michael so, you know, I, I tell Michael, hey, on three, one, two, three, you know, I snap a photo of a, a Michael Jordan, you know, like, and then, and then, man, uh, they play in music and um, uh, Michael had been drinking a little bit at this point, having a good time. And his brother, it was during that, that song in 2009, where Walk It Out, you remember that when that mm -hmm. got real popular back then? Well, Michael's brother, which is a retired army guy, I think he was really big in, in, uh, in the army. He uh, starts walking it out on the dance floor, man. And Michael just breaks up going crazy about this. And I'm standing there beside Michael Jordan. And the door was open here into this restaurant. We were in, we were in Michael Jordan's steakhouse. So I'm in Michael's restaurant. And it's just family and friends and Trey in, in there. And the door's open. And the next thing I know, Michael Jordan high fives me. He has the biggest cigar in his mouth. And I have a photo. I snapped a photo. Michael's laughing at his brother, trying to walk it out on the dance floor. He high fives me and says, man, that's my brother right there. To me, I look to my <laughs> right. I look to my right and it's no light. There's 300 people looking at me and Michael. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm Mike's friend, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking that yeah, to myself. Like they, they think, who's this white dude, you know, standing with Michael Jordan, <laughs> you know. 
I have never experienced, and I can tell you how close it probably was like to be around Elvis with Michael because you know Michael Jordan is in that room. And everyone in that room, man, they know Michael Jordan's right there. And he just has some kind of presence about him that you just feel in there. And I'll just never forget. And the cool part about that is he came up to me and said bye to me before he left. Wow. I went home happy. I showed everybody on the airplane. They were all going crazy because I had the photo. If I didn't have that photo, Billy, no one would believe me. I woke my my parents. You know, uh, yeah, I could show it. I woke my parents up. I woke all my friends up back home. And it was like (laughs) 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning. I mean, you know, I was on, I couldn't go to sleep. You know, my granddad knew me, knew that I would make it happen. And uh, they didn't think I was going to ever leave the party, though. They had to wait out in the casino, you know. But, uh, yeah, so that's my Michael Jordan story in here. And I'm going to try to real quick uh, find this photo for you. It should be right here. But that's how we do. We go to places and make things happen. I made it happen. I TCB'd, as they would say. Now, I've not uh, been that lucky uh, meeting famous people, but wow, I mean, that's the top of the top right there. Well, the cool part about this whole thing, it made Michael Jordan a real person to me. And what I mean by that is ever since that meeting, I was like, man, I could be just like Michael. Yeah. You know, he just he he just did something great in his life, was really good at what he did. And people loved him. People loved him. and, And now he's Michael Jordan, you know. But, man, he's just a human being, just like all of us. And being around him like I was, it really, like, it changed my whole thing of him because it was, he, was, he was a superhero before that. Yeah. He was a man after I hung out with Michael. And then the best part about all this is, is I've become really great friends with DB. Yeah. And uh, DB, uh, I talk on the phone all the time. And uh, here, somebody made this for me afterwards. Uh I remember putting this photo. Check this photo out, guys, if you can see it. Can y'all see that? Yeah, it's or got a little too? bit of a glare, but it's still, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's that, good. That's me Dude, and Michael. You were a youngin. I was 20 years old. Whatever. <laughs> I was 20 years old, and the best part of it is, like, DB and I become, have become good friends. And uh, uh, DB told me that uh, he's done that for a few people because he knows how happy that makes people to meet Michael. Yeah. And he's, he's actually, he said, I've done that quite a few times in, in my life. So DB's like that really a, a cool person. So Michael Jordan, my favorite of all time, I've been able to hang out with. And just two weeks ago, I saw him in Talladega and I, I filmed him. My whole goal was I was going to film Michael landing in Talladega. He owns a, a race team now. And I was going to film him landing his jet in Talladega for the first time. And I made that happen, Billy. You did. I, I have saw a cool picture. video. I have a cool video on my Facebook if y'all are interested. It's so cool seeing Michael's jet with a jump man flying into where I'm from, Talladega. So anyway, who's my second one now? So you, you mentioned him earlier. I got to meet Andy Griffith. That's right. Okay, so Michael I met in 2009. Andy... I met in 2010, so the next year. So, man, I'm having a good time here, you know, Michael, now Andy, both North Carolina boys. So how I did with met Andy Griffith is I'm sitting in a boring college class one day, and I uh, something told me to go on Yahoo and search Andy Griffith. I hadn't done it in a while, and, I, you know, I'd go on there and just see if there was any articles and stuff. So I, I went in there and searched Andy Griffith, and it said that the sheriff of Mayberry was heading to Raleigh. So I clicked on the article, and sure enough, that coming Saturday, this was like a Wednesday or a Tuesday, that Saturday, Andy Griffith was going to be at the swearing-in ceremony of their governor, Bev Perdue. He helped her get elected there in North Carolina, and Andy Griffith was scheduled to read a poem at the ceremony. And I had always told myself, Billy, if I ever, ever had an opportunity to be somewhere I knew Andy Griffith would be, I was going. I was going to be there. So that's exactly what I did. Now, unfortunately, I had scheduled a date already with my girlfriend uh, to, to uh, for that Friday. And I kind of I still did the date. I don't know how I did that. But I, I, I dropped her off at the house. I came back to my house 
I tried to sleep. I couldn't sleep. I was so excited. So I, without telling anyone, I jumped in my mom and dad's car, which I had at that point. And they didn't know because we had separate houses and stuff. They, uh, I didn't tell anyone. I drove all the way to Raleigh, North Carolina, man. Yeah. <laughs> so it took me seven hours. I, I left at like 930. I drove from 930. I got there about five in the morning, 435 in the morning. It was freezing cold. It was in January. I went right to where the ceremony was going to be, be, which was outside of their Capitol building. I saw all the chairs set up and I said, well, man, I'm going to have the best seat in the house. I'm going to be the first front row, right? So I get out of the car and uh, um, I get interviewed by the news station. Hey, are you already here for the ceremony? It was like seven in the morning. I said, yeah, I drove all the way from Alabama because I'm a big fan of Andy Griffith. They put me on the news, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I get a great seat. I'm sitting there and I'm hearing people talking about, yeah, before I left uh, uh, to come here this morning, I learned that some guy drove all the way from Alabama, not to see the governor, but to see Andy Griffith. And the person sitting beside me was like, that's the guy right here. Cause I had already <laughs> told them the story, man. So I'm having all these people. I'm retelling my story of why I was here and stuff. So sure enough, Andy Griffith comes out and does a great point that he had written. And um, it, it was really cool because it was like, wow, that's Andy. I, I can't believe I'm seeing him in person. It's Andy Griffith. So after the ceremony, I knew Andy had to leave somehow. So I didn't think he would leave on the side door where all the crowd was where the governor left at. So I go around to the back of the building and I just wait there. No one is back there, Billy, except me. And sure enough, probably after about 15 minutes, the doors open up and a few people come out and a guy's in a wheelchair. And I realized it was Andy in that wheelchair. And so I said, well, Trey, this is your opportunity. So I approached Andy and Miss Griffith and the three guys helping him. My heart is beating. And I, I, I had learned or read that Andy was not very friendly, as friendly as you think he is. So I didn't want Andy to cuss me out. I thought that that would ruin my life. I would not be, you know, I wouldn't be able to function if I get cussed out by Andy Griffith. So I go up to Miss Griffith and I uh, told her, hey, you know, I'm, I drove all the way from Alabama. I'm a big fan of your husband. Is there any way I could say hello to him? Well, they take me right over to him in the car, man. Now, let me back up. It kind of made me really sad because Andy was very feeble uh, this morning. And it, he needed help to get out of that wheelchair. And I about had to help him get out of the wheelchair. And it, it made me open my eyes about life. Because just a few days ago, I saw him as the sheriff of Mayberry, young in his, in his day. And now he's an older man, feeble, and needed help. And like that really made me sad because I was like, oh, man, you know, Andy's, you know, he's in that kind of shape. And uh, so anyway... They take me over to Andy. He's in the front seat. And I had this camera on me, as I showed y'all. That bad boy right there, which was, had been a great camera. And I told the guy, I said, you think there's any way you could uh, snap a picture with me and Andy? No, I can't do that. It was like his, his response to me. So I let that die. They introduced me to Andy in that front seat, Billy. And the, I remember the guy saying, hey, Mr. Griffith. This guy right here is a big fan of yours. He came all the way from Alabama to meet you. And Andy looks at me, man, and he has a big smile on his face. And I remember saying, I remember saying, hey, Mr. Griffith, I just want to tell you, thank you. I said, I, I want to thank you for all the entertainment that you have provided me. I remember telling him that. And I said, you know, when I was a little guy, I used to dress up as the sheriff of Mayberry when your show was on. And then after the Andy Griffith show went off, Matlock would come on and I would go and put on my best Sunday suit and I would become Matlock. They all laughed at me. Andy Griffith, his <laughs> wife in the back seat, all of them laughing at, at me at that. And I just thanked him, man. And I'm shaking his hand and the guy snapped a photo while I was talking. All right. So he handed me the camera back. I watch as the car drives off into the sunset. I'm thinking, well, I just took care of business. I just met Andy Griffith, just like I said I would. And I look at the photo, 
and the fr the the camera this lens right here froze halfway billy mm. never has that ever... little shutter piece that yes. like that so yeah. I, I guess the guy just really quickly did it and not like looked what he was doing i mean come on man you can't see you can't see me and andy in the in the in the viewfinder here here yeah you know and he just took a real quick shot trying to take a picture and but he didn't take a picture you have the top of my head which is my top hip of my head here and you have andy's top of his car but you don't see andy in the photo but sure oh. enough i did shake his hand i i looked in his eyes he thanked me and I told him, hey, thank you for it, man. I just hope that, man, because he was in his 80s, what, 85, 83 at this point. He died two years later. Um, Might have been 84. Uh, I hope that he thought, well, maybe I did something with my life. I mean, how old was that guy? 20 years old? You know, yeah. he drove all the way from Alabama to meet me and thank me for my entertainment. Maybe, maybe that made him happy that day. I hope so. I hope so. But that's my Andy Griffith story. So I've met two of my favorites. Michael Jordan and Andy Griffin. Cool. I'm telling you, like from a little eight, for me as a little kid, I'm watching the Andy Griffith show, man. I was, I loved Andy Griffith and he was my favorite. You know, everybody seems to love Barney. I've always loved Andy. I thought Andy was the man, you know? Yeah. And, um, but anyway, my next one, Clint Eastwood, my other favorites. Mm. So how did I meet Clint? Now, do you want to share a story or you want me to keep going? Yeah, uh, keep going. All right. So, um, Clint Eastwood, man. So I worked on a, a, his movie Trouble with the Curve in 2012. And um, I spent a week on that set doing uh, extra work. I uh, I had not been doing extra work anymore at this point, but I couldn't pass up an opportunity to watch Clint Eastwood work. So that's what I did. It was kind of like an acting class to me. So um, we uh, filmed at this old rundown motel in Dawsonville, Georgia. And if you see trouble with the curve, it's where he stays at in the movie. He goes and gets on the payphone. I'm behind the cameras in that shot. I watched them film that shot. He smokes a cigar, which was the coolest thing I'd ever, ever seen because he lit that cigar like he did in his Westerns. And I caught that. I was like, wow, that is so cool. How he did that, man. And he, and he, if you watch trouble with the curve, he's sitting on a picnic table at that old motel. I'm behind the shots on that, man. So I'm watching them act clint eastwood set is so cool billy no nobody everybody seems to be happy to be there you don't see that much on film sets Every, a lot of people are frustrated on those film sets because of long days that they have to work clint eastwood seven days they're finished seven hours they're finished in a day uh nobody's yelling everybody's doing their thing and he never even says uh, action or cut he just says good job let's move on or are, are you ready okay you know, it's just so I've picked up a little stuff with what I do now because of how I, I want to be like Clint Eastwood. I mean, he's a legend. But anyway, so how did I meet him? Well, <laughs> he uh, uh, lunch one day. We go to lunch and they have a lunch box, which was like a big uh, trailer that expanded out. And they put all these t t tables in there. And that's where we ate at in, in, in the uh, for lunch. So um I, uh, it was actually, and that's a big trailer. You showed me one. Remember we were in a town where New they Orleans. were filming in, New, in Orleans. New Orleans. And that's, it's like a trailer that just expands out and becomes yeah. a, a canteen. All right, guys. So you, y'all going to love this. Cause only I would get myself into this one. So breakfast is actually breakfast. Uh, I'll get to lunch next, but, uh, breakfast that morning, I get my plate, I get my drink, my orange juice. And I walk up the stairs. It was about five flights of stairs to get into the trailer. And the door was closed. So I sit, I bend over to put my uh, uh, orange juice down to open the door. And I notice the door opening. And someone was standing there open, uh, holding the door for me. So I was like, oh, thank you. And I look and my eyes met Clint Eastwood's eyes. Clint Eastwood was standing there with a smile on his face. Because I bet he thought, I'm about to shock this kid right here. <laughs> He's standing there, open the door for me to come inside. And I was like, oh, thank you. Oh, thanks, Mr. Eastwood. I appreciate that. You know, I changed when I saw it was Clint, you know. So Clint just, you know, smiles at me and I walk in. I'm thinking, well, nobody else this day in, in my life had that happen. I'm the only person in this world that Clint Eastwood just held a door open for. Her. All right. The next day he comes over to us. It was me and another guy that was working as an extra and a few other people. How you fellas doing this morning? 
wow, Clint Eastwood's coming over and asking us how we are. How and he called you, he called us a fella, just like my granddad. And they were the same <laughs> age, you know, it was you know, people that age, that's how they talk. How you fellas doing this morning? So, anyway, for lunch that day, I did something that I would probably only do. <laughs> I went into the lunchbox with my plate, and I noticed Clint Eastwood was sitting on that first table, Billy. And it was Clint, and it was the director of the movie, and it was Clint's cameraman. And it was Chuck, which was Clint's security guy that I had talked to a few times. And I noticed two other things. There was two chairs open right beside Clint Eastwood at this table with all the main people for this production. I noticed another thing. About 10 tables back was all the extras and people in the back where I guess I was supposed to be. Something told me, said, Trey, you're never going to get this opportunity. You better take it. So I did. I slid, I slid my plate right in. And I did not, I didn't put my plate right beside Clint. I put my plate on the other chair, which, so there was one chair between me and Clint Eastwood. And I remember this perfectly, man. I sat down and I looked over at Clint and Clint was looking at me with that smile on his face, probably thinking, you know, this guy's got some guts. (laughs) And uh, I sat there and ate with Clint Eastwood and, and listened to him tell stories about bringing the first ever Ferrari that he ever bought into America. And how they stopped him at the uh, at the um, the security points coming in the the um, the line, and the guys couldn't believe leather seats. They had never seen leather seats before at his Ferrari, so they all just couldn't. They, he was telling us that story, and then he talked about the Gran Torino car. How he really loved that car. Then he talked about some women that I probably don't need to talk about. <laughs> but man, this was I was just like, man, this is the greatest day of my life. I'll never be able to top this. And the best thing is my friend came inside and put his his plate opposite of mine. And he thanked me, man. He said, Trey, thank you so much. I would have never, ever done that. And all the other people are like, what are they thinking they're doing? You know, <laughs> I'm sitting by Clint Eastwood. And he smiled at me. That's my Clint Eastwood story. And, uh, and the best part is I sat there eating my food. And in my in my head, I was like, I know what you're thinking. Did I fire six shots or only five? <laughs> Would it tell you the truth and all that excitement back there? I kind of lost count myself of being here that this is a 44 Magnum and the most powerful handgun in this world, and it could blow your head clean off. You got to ask yourself a question. Spy guy, do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? I did that monologue as I was looking at <laughs> Clint Eastwood. <laughs> I know I'm crazy, guys, but hey, that's my story. And so, in it, so Clint Eastwood, man. So, Billy, I want you to be able to tell yours because I still have I, another cool. Hey, no, keep on, keep on going because I'm I'm not even close to in that realm of right. people that I have have uh, met. So go ahead. All right, guys. We've got, so, uh, we've got uh, eight more minutes, nine more yeah, minutes. We might have to turn this into a second parter. So, yeah. guys, I've been able three of my favorites: Michael, Andy, Clint. Doesn't get any better than, to to me than that. But there is one other person that is on that level that I love to death and have loved since I was a kid. And that is Chuck Norris. I am the biggest Chuck Norris fan in this world. I love Chuck Walker, Texas Ranger. I've been watching that with my dad since I was a little kid and my granddad and all of his movies. So I have become friends with Chuck Norris, Billy. And how in the world did that happen? I don't know. I don't know. Except that in 2004, when I was in the 10th grade, I taught my mom and dad to taking me to Douglasville, Georgia, because Chuck Norris was having a book signing. His autobiography had came out that year uh, against all odds. And I, of course, knew his schedule. And uh, he was coming to Douglasville. And, man, Douglasville, I I knew about Douglasville because we always go to Six Flags and we would pass Douglasville. So I talked them in on a Saturday morning, taking me to Douglasville, Georgia. And, of course, we had to get there early. That's how I do things. And uh, we're, you know, in a line, man. And there's already a big line wrapping around the building when I was there. And uh, so Chuck Norris finally arrives. So cool. So we go in there. And a few months earlier, I had written a um, I had written a letter to his website. Back then, they had like a fan page where you could submit letters and they would pick fan letters and put on the official website. They had picked my letter. (laughs) There's my letter on Chuck's website. And I talked about me, uh, how being a big fan and watching the show with my granddad, my papa, and he had died a year before that and stuff like that. And uh, so (laughs) 
I took that letter. I printed that letter out. So when I met Chuck that day, I showed the letter to them. And it was so cool because his, his wife started reading the letter. And his wife was like, oh, Carlos, that's the letter that your mama picked. So Chuck Norris's mama, who, by the way, turned 102 years old last week. Wow. Chuck's mama is 102 years old. She picked my letter to be on that website. So I was thinking, oh, man, I, that's, that's pretty cool right there. I didn't know that. So Chuck signed my letter to Trey, a friend, Chuck Norris. So I started talking to his bodyguard, Billy. Howard Jackson, the California Flash, which is a boxing champion in his own right. And I noticed that Mr. Jackson is a guy that I've seen many times because Chuck beats him up everywhere. Chuck has beat his friend up in all of his movies, all of his TV shows. I mean, Mr. Jackson's been beat up so many times. But Chuck Norris is, is awesome now because I know. So anyway, Mr. Jackson told me that he remembered my letter because he worked on the website. So he read all the letters and stuff. So, uh, so I came back and Mr. Jackson put me back in at the end of the line and he cut me off. Chuck stayed there about three more hours that day. He signed over a thousand books. He put me at the very end. I was going to be the last person. So I got to go back up there with that letter with Chuck. And that's how I was able to, to, to talk to them and everything. So I became friends with Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson and I would, write emails and stuff. So I stayed in touch with Mr. Jackson. I learned a lot of cool things. Well, unfortunately in 2006, when I was in high school, he died of cancer. Wow. And uh, I, I kept up with him on, on the, uh, on the website and stuff. So fast forward to 2010, Chuck Norris came to Tuscaloosa, Billy, with governor, with uh, Huckabee, Mike Huckabee. When Huckabee was running for the president, Chuck Norris was his big supporter. So I went to that church that day, man. I uh, I found about it. I found out about it on last second. I did my thing. I got there early. I'm at the church. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna try to be four minutes. I'm at the church. First person there, just like with uh, Andy Griffith. I said, man, I'm gonna be in the front row. Next thing I know, the pastor of the church knows me because of my basketball. He had watched me play basketball, and I had played against his son, so he recognized me. So I'm thinking like, yeah, I'm definitely going to be sitting front row now, you know? <laughs> so anyway, Chuck comes there. He does his thing. So incredible speech. And uh, he meets the fans afterwards. So he's he's just meeting everybody. He finally gets to me. And I have my Chuck Norris shirt on and it says, I don't need a weapon. I am what? And that's the picture <laughs> of him for missing in action. It was when the memes were becoming popular. So I said, hey, Mr. Norris, how do you like my shirt? And he read my shirt, man. He punched me on my, uh, he punched me right here. On my, on my shoulder, you know, not really hard, but he punched me. I was like, man, I just got punched by Chuck. <laughs> you know, and he signed my shirt for me. So I see his wife and I, I start talking to Miss Norris and I say, hey, Miss Norris, yeah. I just wanted, I wanted to tell you how sorry I was about y'all's friend, uh, Howard Jackson, dying, that he and I had become friends. Well, man, that touched her. And she started tearing up. She talked to me for like 20 minutes, Billy. And, and, and he, she was like, Trey, you don't know how much this means means to me so the next thing i know i walk outside and chuck finally gets to the car and there's like 500 people around us and she comes over and gives me this big old hug and thanks me again and tells me to keep in touch with them and i said you know i'm probably so oh, i will <laughs> you know and uh the next thing i know billy the window opens and chuck norris motions for me to come over to the car and I'm walking over there in front of all these people and Chuck wants to shake my hand. And he said, he said that, Hey, my wife told me what you said about our friend. And I just wanted to say how I appreciate that, man. And Chuck Norris looks at me, Billy, and he did something that I'll never forget. I think about often. He said, Hey, Trey, whatever you do in life, do good. Chuck Norris told me that I've always thought about that. If Chuck ever watches this, you know? And uh, so anyway, they drive off a few years go by. I'm in a, I mean, I find out that he's going to be somewhere else. And of course, I'm there. And that's in Birmingham where you're filming, Billy. You don't know me. I don't know you at this point, but I am on your film because I'm with Chuck. I guess God made this happen so I could have these moments captured. But I hung out with Chuck that day because they remembered me. 
and they were like, hey, you're going to be with us. And uh, we go there to the BJCC, and I walk Chuck and them back to the hotel because I knew my way around that. So, man, I have been able to hang out with Chuck Norris to actually talk with them personally, to talk with Marshall Teague, his friend that's on all of his Walker shows. He's one of the big villains on the show. I got to hang out with Marshall Teague that day. And uh, Chuck, in the he was honored at an Action Fest film festival in Asheville. I was with them. I was backstage with them. That's the coolest moment. I, got, I have to mention this. Y'all will like this. We're standing there in the green room. And all these people are around Chuck. And they're just talking like stories about their filming. And it's Chuck Norris and it's Aaron Norris, which is Chuck's brother. And the director of a lot of the episodes of Walker, Texas Ranger. And some of his movies. And he said, the next thing I know, I'm standing there with Chuck and Miss Norris. And I have the photo of this. And everybody starts laughing. And we look over and they have a screen right there of missing in action playing. And Chuck in the shot had just came out of the water and he was blowing everybody away with a machine gun. And Chuck is just laughing. And I'm standing there watching Chuck blow everybody away on this cool iconic scene. And I'm standing there with Chuck Norris himself watching himself do this. And he's just a smiling. I mean, how did that happen for me, man? You know? And uh, so anyway, that is my Chuck Norris story. And, uh, you know, you know, for a fact, because I put this in your 50% on Tiger Man Karate Dojo and Museum, Trey Miller donated for display that karate gi that I won from Chuck. That is it's not gi, a belt. Black a belt. belt. Yeah, but it's, it's his black belt. It's one of his yes. uh, that he signed. And it, there's limited editions because I, I won something. Yeah, and uh, that was on display for a while there in the Tiger Man. Sure was. Uh, because of me and Chuck yeah. Norris. So, you know, because Chuck has that Elvis connection, man. So, yeah. yeah, man, that's my Chuck Norris story. So I've been able to meet all just about all my favorite people uh, that I, I grew up loving. That's very cool. And what he's talking about, and Trey and I met the first time here, but we didn't realize that we met the first time here. It was a Glenn Beck event in Birmingham, and they actually walked from the church Martin the Kings. to the BJCC. And I walked backwards in front of them that whole way and got to talk to Chuck. And Trey's right there. On late, Later, <laughs> we talk about that. And he goes, well, I was there. And I go, well, then you're on my camera, on my film. And I go, and back sure enough, I was. And there you are. <laughs> sure enough, I'm right there with Chuck. I'm right behind him walking. Yeah, you sure And we got to the BJCC. Gina? Am I remembering that right? Gina Norris. Yeah, Gina okay. Norris. And remember okay. Billy? And, and the best thing about it, guys, is Billy could have walked in there with me and Chuck Norris and Marshall Teague and Gina. But, Billy, you didn't do it because you had something on you. I had my gun with me, so I didn't go inside. I thought they would wand you and all that. No, they didn't. <laughs> and uh, and they didn't, so I messed up. But I was right there with them. Yeah. You were, so, But, man, that is so cool that you were able to capture that, man. I walked backwards. How far was that? How many miles? That, that was, was a, a few miles, man, because that yeah. was from that church that the bur bombing yeah. happened in Birmingham in yeah, the 60s. that's right. And it was all the way to the BJCC, man, which was a lot of few blocks. Yeah, it was a lot. It was uh, That was an interesting day, and that was fun. Well, we're over by about three minutes. Sorry, guys, but, man, what incredible stories. And those, those blow my uh, meeting famous people away, so... I don't well, have anything even near that. So. Yeah, but tell the one about you were talking about, Tiny Tim. Who's Tiny well, Tim? Well, I we'll do that in another episode. Okay. We'll talk about Tiny Tim in another episode. So so thank you so much for watching, friends, or listening. Yeah. And we appreciate it. And make sure that you smash that like button and tighten up every chance you get. And Trey just showed you that if you want to meet somebody or you want to do something, you can. Yeah. But you got to actually go and do it. Don't be forceful, be nice, and people yeah. will be nice back. Look, these people are, and that's why I'm so lucky, is Chuck Norris became just a, a regular person to me. Uh, Michael Jordan, the same way, like I said. Clint Eastwood, the same way. These people are, are they're nice. And if you just treat them nicely, I mean, don't go crazy around them, uh, but just be normal and and uh, introduce yourself and just hey, tell them, hey, I really appreciate uh, what you've done for me. You've entertained me. And it's worked for me. I yeah. mean, it's worked for me, as you can. Don't fangirl them. Just yeah. go up and and be nice and and acknowledge that you appreciate them and and they'll be nice to you. Right. Thank y'all so much. Tighten up every chance you get.